Welcome to Sunspots, where we highlight the many ministries and missions happening on the surface of the sun, that is, the Synod of the Sun. A region of the Presbyterian Church USA, we are Presbyterians in Arkansas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Texas, with dynamic and hopeful ministry happening in the name of Jesus Christ. Our prayer is that you find inspiration, community, and connection in the sun. This is a special bonus edition of Sunspots. Today, we feature a presentation by Dr. Lisa Allgood to the Indian Nations Presbytery Stated Meeting on February 27th. Dr. Allgood is both a transitional presbyter in Cincinnati Presbytery and an immunocytochemist for nearly four decades. Lisa has been bringing wisdom, expertise, and practical advice to our denomination for the past eight months. The intersectionality of her skills and experience in both presbytery work and immunology has made her presentations an invaluable asset to presbyteries and churches during the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Allgood spoke to Indian Nations Presbytery about where we are now in the COVID-19 pandemic and offered practical advice for churches about the timing and circumstances of gathering together. So welcome to this special edition of Sunspots. Let's get started. Thank you, Madam Moderator. This is actually very easy. Lisa and I have become uh, familiar faces and friends electronically through through uh, the Mid-Council Association and also many presbytery meetings. Lisa, uh, you know, I, I think about Ruth and the story for such a time as this. She was she was clearly called by God into the, the perfect storm and the perfect uh, location for her background and interests. She's a former uh, epidemic immunologist or epidemiologist, I can't remember which, but she is uh, well steeped in the science field and has many gifts and has been advising and guiding us through this pandemic with uh, many statistics uh, made easy and uh, recognizable for those folks who uh, have difficulty understanding all of the technical details. We're thrilled that she joined us. And my apologies, Lisa, that uh, uh, your report came so long into the meeting that you had to endure all of the nonsense of Indian Indian Nations Presbytery, but we welcome you and we're grateful for you. Charlie, thank you. You have the same nonsense that I have in many in many cases. So, uh, actually, it was thank you for having me because it was a, a joy and a blessing to be able to listen to the work that you do. Um, it's not easy, and in this time, it is especially not easy. So, I understand you want to finish by one thirty. I will. I'm a New Yorker by birth, so I can talk really fast. Um, but I'm also willing to take questions as I go through this, and so I will not try to lead you all the way to 1.30. I am an immunocytochemist by training. I spent 36 years in the pharmaceutical industry. I'm now on my third failed retirement, um, but I worked with the Presbytery of Cincinnati for the last five years as COM moderator and with our prior presbyter, Nancy Kehan, to really do some really deep dive strategic work into the Presbytery of Cincinnati. And when Nancy left um, uh, quicker than we thought we would, the council said, Lisa, can you just stay for three months to just keep the lights on? And two years later, I'm still here. And I am now actually, they've gotten rid of all of the interim transitional kinds of titles. So I'm here permanently. Um, but it, we find ourselves in a crazy time. So I'm going to very quickly go through some background on the virus. We're going to talk about the consequences of the virus from a medical standpoint. Um, and then we're going to talk about global stats, the variants, and the vaccines. And I will um, be happy to take questions as we go. So coronaviruses are not new to humans. There are seven different ones known. Uh, Four of those coronaviruses basically caused the common cold, along with a number of other kinds of viruses. We have had two that have caused, I will will say, mini pandemics. SARS uh, came out of Singapore in 2004 and really went mostly into Canada, um, but didn't spread further than that. MERS came out of the Middle East in 2012. Both of those were not nearly as infectious as COVID-19, but they were actually far more fatal. Um, It's called a coronavirus because of the crown of protein spikes around the surface. You've all seen the pictures. It's actually a very wimpy virus in 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 a fundamental way. It's a sack of fat 
with those protein spikes on the outside and a single strand of messenger RNA inside. That's its genetic code. Those protein spikes are what attach to a, a respiratory cell. Remember, this is an aerosolized virus, and it actually injects the mRNA into the cell. The cell then, it, the mRNA then takes over the mechanisms of the cell. It replicates more virus. It bursts the cell, and the virus keeps going. Um, all coronaviruses spread through aerosol aerosolization or mucus exposure. This is, again, a wimpy virus. It only lasts about three to four days on an impermeable surface, like a doorknob or a light switch or the back of a pew. It lasts about one to two days on a permeable surface, like a, a bulletin or a hymnal. And we can talk about that a little bit. We've known about coronaviruses for a long time. We've also known how to genetically sequence them. And so the reason we have a vaccine as quickly as we do is that the genetic sequence on the original coronavirus that came out of Wuhan was actually completed more than a year ago. It was completed in January of 2020. COVID-19 is three times more infectious than any other respiratory virus. The chances of being exposed depend on how many virus particles you're exposed to and also the length of time you're exposed. But this one is so infectious that the maximum exposure time is only 15 minutes. You don't need to be exposed more than that for you actually to hit the plateau. The infection rate in the United States is about 15 times that of the rest of the world. We, are, we do not have this under control. We are now at one in 11 people infected in the United States. Los Angeles has one in five, Florida has one in five, and there are reasons for that. We are in a decline for the number of new infections per day that are being reported, as well as the number of new deaths per day that are being reported. Right now, we're about at 1,600 deaths per day. Uh, we're about at 66,000 new infections per day in the, across the United States, but that's one every one and a half seconds. I mean, that's, a, that's still a, a very high infectious rate. This virus is insidious. This is not one to mess with. So 40% of those who are infected are asymptomatic, but they're still infectious. And so you can be sitting across from someone who has no symptoms, that includes temperature. So if you're taking forehead um, temperature scans, it's probably not catching everybody, but they are still shedding virus and they are still infecting you. Um, for those people who do go on to get symptoms, they can be infectious but asymptomatic for up to eight days before their symptoms emerge. So you think about that in terms of church life, that can be two consecutive Sundays where someone has no symptoms yet, but they are still shedding virus. This is not just a disease of older people. The symptomology that emerges, the, the disease part that emerges tends to emerge the older you are or the more serious underlying medical conditions you have. But there was a study done in August in three different sites across the United States in a, ch in a group of children, four to 17. And it was shown that even though they are almost always asymptomatic, unless they have an underlying medical condition, they actually had up to 25 times the amount of virus in their nasal passages than a hospitalized adult. That means they are a significant source of community spread. Documented cases of reinfection have have occurred. It's probably due to one of these variants that has emerged, even though they emerged early on. But it is also true that the, um, the native immune response to being infected is actually quite weak. The, um, the antibodies don't stick around very long. We don't exactly understand the cellular mechanisms of, it, of the immune response in this case. We've only known about this virus for about 14 months now. The other thing to remember is that the exposure here is multiplicative. If you look at your, your Zoom screen and you pick out 10 faces and you come together with those 10 people and those 10 people have also been with 10 other people that day, that means each one of you has been with 100 people. So your bubble is bigger than you think it is. Currently, the World Health Organization reports more than 1.3 million confirmed cases of COVID globally with about 2.5 million reported deaths. Every country is involved. No country has been exempt. In the United States, we have almost 29 million confirmed cases of COVID. And as of this morning, when I looked, 515,000 deaths reported. That is more than all of the American deaths from World War II, Vietnam, and Korea combined. And it is also the highest per capita in the world for both infectivity and for death. We account for 26 of all global infections and 20% of all global deaths, even though we have about 5% of 
of the global population, less than 5%. It took us four months to get to 100,000 deaths. It took us 10 months to get to 300,000 deaths. It's only taken us two months more to get to 500,000 deaths. And so the death rate has gone up significantly. We can talk about why later. Basically, a person dies from COVID every 15 seconds. The fatality rate for COVID generally is actually not very high. It's only 1%. Um, that's 10 times more than the flu. The flu is about 0.1%, but it, but it is far more infectious than anything else we've ever seen. And it's far less fatal than things like Zika or Ebola or even SARS, which were about at a 50% death rate. However, the long-term medical consequences of this virus are almost unprecedented. So for every one fatality, you have 19 hospitalizations. That is a huge impact on the medical community. And because the United States was not only unprepared for this virus, we've not actually had a pandemic like this since 1918. It was also under, um, well, our government didn't do us any favors, let's put it that way. We are so split by states and by county that we had no unified response to this virus. And that's part of the reason both our infectivity rate and our death rate are so high. For every one fatality, there are 18 permanent cardiac damage. That's either the virus getting into the cardiac muscle or this virus tends to promote a hyperimmune response. It's something called a cytokine storm and it creates such massive inflammation throughout the body that organs can be damaged and the heart is one of those. For every one fatality, there are 10 permanent lung damages. I've seen MRIs and CAT scans of young female cross-country runners, some of the healthiest lungs you'll ever see, and they are permanently scarred on the bottom. They will never have that lung capacity back again. For every one fatality, there are three permanent kidney damages. For every one fatality, there are two permanent cognitive dysfunctions. A study that came out back in November showed that with that permanent cognitive dysfunction, you actually lose nine IQ points, which is the equivalent of about 10 years of cognitive function. For every one fatality, there are two permanent neurological damage. One of the cardinal symptoms of COVID is loss of taste and smell. That's a central nervous system function. But what happens is you can actually also have loss of mobility, loss of the ability to walk, all the way through to psychoses. It affects the thyroid, so it can mess up your metabolism. It affects the um, pancreas. It can actually cause type 2 diabetes. It is a nasty, nasty, um, nasty, nasty virus. And so it's not one that we want anybody to mess with. Um, the variants that are showing up, it, this is not at all unexpected. This is what viruses do. When viruses replicate in the body, they tend to replicate their genetic material incompletely. And so what happens is you're actually watching evolution occur almost on a minute by minute basis because the virus replicates so fast. Right now, we are aware of more than 4,000 variants that have been identified. Some of them have been sequenced. Some of them are from the United States. 29% of the variants in the United States are in Florida. And so these things um, are, are infectious very, very quickly. Most of those variants uh, are less infectious and less robust than the native virus, and they will die out very quickly. But there are some that are emerging, and you've heard about them, that are far more infectious, also more virulent, they cause more severe disease, and they can be more fatal. Um, there are two that have, been, have emerged in the United States. California uh, emerged about a month ago. New York was just honestly discovered about a week ago, but they are already uh, responsible for the spikes in those two areas. Cases attributed to the New York variant have risen more than 12% in the last two weeks. And the California variant is actually more than half the cases in the state of, um, uh, 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 in every county across the state. The United Kingdom mutation is hi more highly infectious, about 50% more infectious than the original virus. It is more virulent and fatal, particularly in younger ages 25 to about 45. It appears to be covered by the current vaccines, but at a lower rate. The UK variant is doubling every 10 days in the United States. Right now it's in more than 45 states and 92 countries. And it will soon, probably in the next week or two, take over as the prevalent virus that's spreading in the United States. There are two South African mutations, also more infectious, also slightly more virulent. Um, one is, is a little more refractive to the vaccine than the other. 
Uh, they, it's one of them that has been found in the United States is in 15 states currently. The Brazilian mutation is also more highly infectious, also slightly more virulent. We haven't tested the vaccines against it yet, but it seems to be okay. It's in five states in the United States and also spreading. Uh, the mutation from California is in eight states in eight countries. So we are now also exporting uh, mutations. Um, coronaviruses mutate slowly, but um, so, and much more slowly than the flu virus. So the fact that we're seeing this many is again, not unexpected, but, um, but still of concern. And the CDC is warning that we may in fact despite the vaccinations that are going on, see a fourth spike in COVID cases increasing over the next 14 weeks. And so all of the same uh, requirements really stay in place. So let's talk about the vaccines for a second. Right now, there are still 20 vaccine candidates in phase three clinical trials. Those are the very large phase clinical trials, 30 to 40,000 people. We have two vaccines approved in the United States with a third one who will be approved today. Moderna and Pfizer both have been approved. Those are both based on mRNA. They're based on the genetic material from the virus itself. It's a snippet of that material that does not cause disease, but it does code for one of the protein spikes. And so what it does is when that is injected into the human body, it teaches the human body how to recognize that spike and then mount a response against it without ever causing disease. mRNA vaccines have been in development for other types of viruses for decades. It's again, one of the other reasons we were able to bring this one to market so quickly. And even though it's only been around for a couple of months, we actually have decades of safety data for this general platform. So there's way more safety out, data out there than people are being led to believe. It's the first time these vaccine types, mRNA vaccines, have been commercialized in the United States. Originally, we were told that they had to be refrigerated for distribution and transport up to negative 70 degrees Fahrenheit. That made that very difficult. Pfizer has now done additional studies and reversed that and says it can be transported and stored in a regular freezer. Moderna has not yet gotten there. Um, they are approved for ages 16 and up, and that's an important thing that we're going to talk about when we get to herd immunity. They are not approved for lower than the age of 16. Once you get the vaccination, it can take two to four weeks for your native immunity to actually develop. You can still be infected by COVID during that time, and you can certainly still pass the virus on even when you've achieved full immunity. And that's the reason why everyone is saying, even if you've gotten both of your shots, you still need to wear a mask you still need to socially distance, you still need to do all of the same kinds of precautions that we've been living with for the last year. You can still be infectious for someone else. The Moderna booster is a four week, the uh, Pfizer booster is a three week booster. That is to get you from about 80% effectiveness to 95% effectiveness. And when I talk about those numbers, that is on a population basis. That's an epidemiologic number. And so I need you to think about this really carefully. 95% effective means that 19 out of 20 people are covered, but it also means that statistically one out of 20 is not. And so not everybody develops a full-blown immune response to these vaccines. That's part of the other factor that we have to consider with herd immunity. Both Moderna and Pfizer have tested their vaccines in the lab against the, the primary variants that are emerging. And they do appear to be effective, although at, at about an 80% rate. And so again, at 80% rate, that means two out of 10 people are not covered for that variant by those vaccines. But both Moderna and Pfizer are already in clinical testing with boosters of their vaccines against the variants. For that reason, it is incredibly likely um, that these will be annual vaccinations, just like the flu, that we will be dealing with COVID, excuse me, COVID vaccines on an annual basis. Not at all unexpected. Um, the one that will be approved today by FDA, I watched the advisory committee meeting yesterday, will be the J&J &J vaccine. That is a single dose vaccine. It's made with a different platform. It's actually a, a piece of the actual protein spike 
attached to a different non um, disease causing virus, an adenovirus. So that adenovirus is active in the sense that it will infect a cell, but it's not active in the sense that it will cause any disease of its own. I think the other thing I wanna say, because this is a little bit of urban legend that's out there, the mRNA vaccines do not change your genetic code. That mRNA does not interact in any way, shape or form with your genetic code. So it is simply coding for the virus itself. Um, the J&J &J vaccine, because it's a one-shot um, vaccination and because it doesn't require extreme refrigeration, is a much easier vaccine to distribute and, and um, transport. It's also a much easier vaccine to get into the third world because it doesn't require anything crazy. And so it's, it will be a game changer for us. However, J&J &J is not making a lot of it at this point, uh, the way that Pfizer and Moderna had pre-manufactured pre vaccine. And so it will take a little bit of time for them to catch up. The J&J &J vaccine is about, on average, 75% effective against the native vaccine, which means, you know, three out of four are protected, but one might not be. Um, and it's only about 50% uh, effective against the variants. And so it is a much weaker vaccine. However, still a good vaccine to get. And so as you start to get eligible for vaccination, just stick out your arm and take whatever they're going to get for you. I've actually had both my Pfizer vaccines because I'm eligible for a different reason. And I will tell you, it was a piece of cake. The only, the only side effect I got was a very sore arm, sort of like a, a tetanus shot sore. There are other vaccines that are coming. AstraZeneca is approved in Europe. It's not yet approved in the US. It was not tested in ages 65 or older. And so it will have a restricted um, ability to, to, be, to be used as a vaccine, but it will probably be approved in the United States. Novavax is the other one. These are both made along the same kinds of lines as J&J. &J. And so these are, these are definitely coming. So here's the, here's the big thing. Um, we talked a lot about population. We talked a lot about what the virus does. We talked a lot about how it doesn't cause a lot of disease in the young and that the vaccines are approved 16 and above. All of the questions about when we can get back to church rest on whether or not we can ever achieve herd immunity. And herd immunity is, de is defined as 70 to 85% of the entire population vaccinated. Right now in the United States, 30% of the, the populace is saying they will not get the vaccine. And these are adults, um, which makes it hard to get to herd immunity. People younger than 21 account for 25% of our population. We won't have a vaccine for them until probably at this fall at the earliest. There are clinical trials going on in, in children down to the age of four. That means we're not going to get to herd immunity until sometime in very, very late this year. And so as you start in, engaging with your sessions about can we please go back, the answer is herd immunity is not going to come until about November, December. And so I won't, I won't go back to church. But um, epidemiologically, the World Health has declared that COVID is an endemic virus. We will never be rid of COVID. It will be with us for the rest of our lives. And so the hope is that as we do go get to global herd immunity, that this becomes a disease that young children ages one to three catch and they will experience it as a mild cold for the most part and the rest of us will be immune to that. That's the way that we have managed a number of diseases from a vaccination standpoint. So again, not at all surprising. I said before, it's likely this will be an annual vaccine. It is also not out of the question that this is um, something for which we will be required to carry a vaccination card if you want to travel. Um, that's not without precedent. If you've ever been to Africa, you can't go between certain countries unless you can show proof of yellow fever vaccination. So that's not surprising. Okay, so I'm going to stop there and see if there are questions on the science stuff. And then we can go on very quickly and talk about what does this mean for going back to church? Any questions? You can put them in the chat or raise your hand um, and I'll try and keep an eye out. Lisa, thank you for the uh, specific uh, Oklahoma data, by the way. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, you guys, are, you actually have one county in the very, uh, let me get my, my geographic cardinal points right, very northwest county in your panhandle is the only one that's at high risk as of this morning. I did look. The rest of you are coming back down, and so keep that up. Any questions on the science? I know I completely overwhelmed you. 
Herd immunity is based on the global population. You, you can do it in smaller chunks. You can do herd immunity for your congregation. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about herd immunity in the United States, but we are a global society with lots of airline travel between countries. And so yes, real herd immunity is going to be based on global population. Um, I don't know where clergy fall in the Oklahoma vaccine plan. I did look it up. Um, I will say that the vaccination plans are literally county by county. Uh, this is not a political statement, but our prior administration cut off any, any um, national collaboration or coordinated response at the knees when they cut off CDC. And so in Oklahoma, even your vaccination, uh, where you are in the vaccination rubric, depends on what county you're in. Only one state that I'm aware of has declared that clergy are eligible to be vaccinated throughout the state, and that was New Hampshire, because they actually inserted into their rubric a, a phrase, essential to the social fabric. And that, and clergy fell into that, which I thought was a fabulous phrase, by the way. I'm not trained as clergy, but I loved that phrase. Other states had, had and other counties have moved clergy up on, on their own determination. Here in Ohio, um, it's a little bit of both. We're at 65 up and a special uh, medical precondition um, or frontline healthcare worker. And um, there are places where, because if people don't show up for their vaccination, if you put yourself on a list, you can be called regardless of where you fall in any rubric and say, if you're willing to come stick your arm out, come get your vaccination. So I have lots of friends and this is how I got it as well. I'm not 65 yet. Um, and even though I have a medical degree, I don't, I don't practice. So um, someone called and said, I've got vaccine, come get it. And I got two doses. And so there are ways to do it. Other states, if you are a caretaker for someone who is in that category, uh, someone who has an underlying medical condition, you can also request to be vaccinated so that the entire bubble is, is covered. So there's tons of ways to do it. Sue, I think you have a question. Uh, I wanted to know about the 90 day, uh, parameters that there's nine, uh, the, the nurse told my son they have 90 days after they've had COVID before they can get the vaccination. And then after the three weeks, they only really say that, that the, the vaccination will be effective for 90 days. And so I haven't heard anything about revaccination or what happens after that 90 day window. Okay, so so yes, if you've had COVID, you have to wait until you're cleared and you have to wait 90 days. And the reason is they don't want the vaccination um, to be disrupted by the fact that you already have native antibodies. So they don't want those antibodies to compete with one another. And so that's the reason to wait 90 days if you've been diagnosed with COVID. Um, the, it, I will say it's not completely, so uh, sorry, let me go back and do this again. After the first shot, it takes two to four weeks for your body to respond and start to produce antibodies. And so you're not immune the, the minute the needle touches your skin. It takes two to four weeks. Because the booster for Pfizer is three weeks, the booster for Moderna is four weeks. The first, um, and I will say Israel is the country that's done the best on this. And so actually I have the most data out of Israel. The first Pfizer vaccination gives you about 80% protection for up to six weeks. And then it starts to decline just a little bit. It's the booster that gets you to 95%. And so CDC has said in cases, especially when we had snowfall in crazy places like Oklahoma in the last couple of weeks, when your three week booster is disrupted, you're still covered. You just have to, you just have to make sure that you get it as soon as you possibly can. So um, you are, as far as we can tell, your immunity is long lived up to about nine months. That's the only data we have. It doesn't say it stops at nine months. We're continuing to get data. It looks like, um, it looks like everyone will be immune with at least Moderna and Pfizer. That's the data I've got right now um, for the year. And then I think we're all gonna be on an annual booster. And that booster will also then cover other variants that are coming in. So that's the good thing about getting a booster. Sue, did that answer your question? Good, all right. Any other questions? And then maybe we can open it up to, what does this mean for church? Because like us, we're getting warm here um, and Easter is coming and Easter is an emotional time um, and a family time and a time when you get more walk-ins than you actually have members. Uh, everybody wants to go back. And I have actually had 
uh, pastors threatened with their call by people in the pews saying, if we're not back by Easter, I don't know, maybe we should rethink this. And I've had to go and shake my finger at them a little bit. Um, this is what I've been telling churches. First of all, um, it can be done safely if you're careful. And it really depends on your context. And, and context is everything here. I have big urban churches, big suburban churches, and little tiny churches that go all the way out to the edge of Appalachia in Ohio, into Indiana, and down into Southern Kentucky. And so I've got one of each. Tiny, tiny churches that only have four people, and they're all related to one another, and they're masked, and they can come sit together, they're probably okay, um, especially as these vaccines start to roll out. My churches with massive sanctuaries that are doing pre-registration and only allowing 10% of their capacity in where they can really social distance and they stay masked, they're probably fine. Um, but, the, but the key is you can't compare yourself to any other church. So I've got mid-sized churches that get full and they look at the big Catholic church across the street and say, but they're back. And my point is, and what needs to be true for you to go back? Obviously, if I were queen, I would say, stay virtual if you can. And I'm really glad I got to see and hear the first part of your, um, your meeting because I understand that's not, that's not feasible in all cases. It's not feasible in all cases for my churches either. And so to keep people in the kingdom, we've done a whole bunch of different things. I have churches that mail out sermons and hymns and liturgies and um, responsive readings and people will do it on their own. I have churches that are virtual, 100%, and, and will probably be that way until December. I have churches that are back hybrid, 10% in a large sanctuary, still streaming virtual. They've got 750 people online. They're doing better financially than they've ever done before. We have virtual membership in some of our churches now with virtual deacons, so we're starting to get there. Um, and I have some churches that are just chomping at the bit and don't know really what to do. Uh, like you, we actually had a, a technical grant program that we instituted in November of 2019. So we've been able to buy equipment for people and get more of them virtual rather than not. But here's what really should be true. First of all, it is session who decides building utilization, not the pastor. Because of that, it is also a session that must determine what needs to be true if they want to open the building and they're going to vote that way. That means are masks required and are masks required to be worn for the entirety of the service? And uh, is pre-registration required and how is that going to be managed? What, how do they physically create social distancing in the, in the sanctuary? Do they tape off pews? It should be every other pew, however they're going to do it. How is the rest of the building utilized? How about bathrooms? Um, all of those questions come before session. And then once they've determined that, it is up to session to police that, which means they've got to stand at the door on a Sunday morning. And if someone's trying to come in without a mask and masks are required, they've got to have the backbone to turn that person away. That's hard. That's really, really hard. And actually, once you put that in front of a session, it makes them realize that they have a level of accountability and a level of responsibility and a level of liability that may make them rethink what needs to be true to open the sanctuary back up. It can't be the pastor's job. And that's really first and foremost. You all have another role that you have to play. And so session really has to take that on. I would, I would if I were queen, I would say masks are required at all times. I would say physical distancing of at least six feet is required for family units. And I would say that you restrict movement around the building, certainly no fellowship hour. If you're gonna open bathrooms, I've had churches um, mark off every six feet on the, in the hallway and then one person at a time and they wipe everything down with an alcohol wipe before they leave and the next person goes in. All of those things are fair game. The two things that become the most emotional are can you sing? because singing is an important part of our worship, and how do you handle air conditioning and heating? Singing is like a four minute sustained cough, and a cough travels at 50 miles an hour. And so the, the aerosolization, particularly in dry air in the, in the winter when we've got heat on, goes at least 24 to 30 feet. So if you're singing without a mask, you, you might as well just be coughing on someone at that point. So if singing is going to occur, it should occur with a mask on. If you can, 
You should be distanced more than six feet. And my advice would be one of two things, either find a different way to get the music out there. A soloist who's distanced and masked, a couple of, I've got one church who has four um, opera students from the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music. They're distanced by more than 18 feet, they're masked and they're way away from the congregation. I have one congregation that has a pianist. They also have a screen and they put the lyrics of the hymn up on the screen and just let the pianist play. And it's a wonderfully meditative way to think about the hymn because everybody knows the hymns. So there are other ways to do it besides singing. If you're going to sing and you're back in the sanctuary, consider cutting it down to two verses instead of six. Just try and limit the amount of time that that's going on even with a mask. And yes, double masks are better. The best double mask you can make is a thick fabric mask and put a piece of um, vacuum cleaner bag in there. It's the best mask you can make. Those vacuum cleaner bags are generally impregnated with things that block dust. That will also help block the virus. The other thing that's tough is blowing air. There was a study that came out of Wuhan back in December, uh, one of the very first studies that was a perfect metaphor for an enclosed mid-size sanctuary. There was an air conditioner and no open windows, no fresh air ventilation. There was one gentleman who was infectious and they could literally map all of the people around him that he infected because the air conditioner was blowing air around this closed room. So my advice has been both last summer when we were air conditioned and this winter, if you have any HVAC system that blows air, pre-air condition, pre-heat, and then turn off the blowing part when people are in the sanctuary. So don't blow air around. I've been asked, but I have this amazing filter. I have this amazing UV system. That's great for about the first 30 seconds the air leaves the system. But as soon as it blows over someone who may be infected and you won't know it, that air is dirty. And so minimize blowing air in the sanctuary. If you can open doors and open windows and create a stream of fresh ventilation, that's great. That's the best way to do it. Um, if you can worship outside, that's super. I've had uh, congregations that created a big circle all distanced. And when it came time for them to sing, they actually turned outside and sang out of the circle. Uh, what a great way to witness to your neighbors. So that's the kind of thing we've been talking about with, um, with, our, with our congregations here in, in Cincinnati. I, right now out of 67 congregations, I only have seven that are back in one way, shape or form. Most of them are waiting until warm weather to see whether they're ready to go back or not. Okay, deep breath. Lisa, may I go back? Yeah. With, with a question. I, we have heard about ibuprofen taken related to uh, vaccinations. Some say don't, some say it's okay. What, what's your advice? Uh, the advice is don't take anything prophylactically. So don't take it in advance of getting the vaccination, thinking you're going to minimize symptoms because that actually um, sort of quiescents your, your immune system. It actually has been shown that you don't develop as robust an immune response that way. However, after the vaccination, if you have symptoms, it's perfectly fine to take it. Thank you. You're welcome. I've stunned you all into silence. Lisa. Yes, ma'am. Um, <laughs> we were scheduled to take a break at 11 <laughs> o'clock and we've gone over that time. So I'm wondering if you can give us your best five minutes more because we will have to take a break. And we yes, and I apologize for that. Um, I, I mean, I think I'm done unless you've got questions, but what I will do Charlie, I will send you the updated um, as of today numbers, that sheet, it's just the same sheet with the numbers updated. I think you have everything else. Please feel free to share that. Um, my last thing, I guess, is uh, first of all, take hope. God is still in control. This is okay. This is typical. Um, your sessions can create a decision tree um, and I will send some additional information to Charlie that he can send out to help you do that. Um, as well as a, a website that you can go to to look county by county to see where you are to factor into that decision tree. But there's a bunch of, a bunch of things that I've already sent Charlie and I'll send some more. Um, last question, do air purification systems help? Like I said, not really. They help for the first 30 seconds that the air leaves. But if you've got someone who's infected and that air is blowing over that person, that air is infected. It doesn't clean that air at that point. 
Thank you so much. You're more than welcome. If you've got questions, Charlie knows how to get a hold of me. Please don't hesitate to, to send them in and be safe and be blessed. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, my great pleasure. Thank you very much. You guys take care. In the Synod of the Sun, we believe when we work together across boundaries, we make visible the good news and find wholeness as the body of Christ. In our common calling, we impact lives together. So let's remember to connect with, equip, and empower one another in the name of Jesus Christ, today and every day.